last time, oh, it seems like ages since we spoke, but last time we spoke was after you sent me photos of Simpson Lee House and the bushfires. That's right. And that seems like a thousand years ago now. Yeah, but it lives very, but it also lives in my memory, very nearby. Yeah. Um, those fires were so dramatic, and so catastrophic. When you think about the loss of habitat, 22% of our native forests, parkland in our national parks lost to fire. Habitat lost, 1 billion estimated native animals died. What an incredible tragedy. And rainforests formed for the first time in the history of the development of those rainforests. Yeah. Extraordinary times. It's interesting, isn't it? The, the pandemic has just taken all the conversation away from what was a, a, a worldwide acknowledged climate event. The fires were, were covered around the world. The f fundraising was worldwide. Um, the discussion was all about climate and climate change. Yeah. And then in the blink of an eye, that stopped and we all started talking about coronavirus, which I'm sure we'll all get through some way or another and, and the climate problem will still be there. I, I gave a talk at UTS last week and I quoted Umberto Eco talking about climate change 12 years ago in a lecture that he gave. Yes. Simply saying that um, of all of the elements, you know, fire in the form of heat is cooking the planet and causing a massive amount of, um, of um, catastrophic environmental events. And, I, and that was 12 years ago. And I think you're right. I think now's the time, while we're in the mood for change, which we clearly are, that we start really banging that drum hard and try to get, at least for what you and I do, try to get our buildings to work as well as they can environmentally. Well, I, for my part, getting our buildings working environmentally reasonably well mm. is no no less important than being able to get waste out of the building and water supply in and things like that. It should be just an automatic part of thinking of how buildings work and how we respond. As I've always said, at the design of our buildings should be breathing in many ways. We've got huge problems with our regulations that cl close our buildings down. Our buildings should leak air. And That's yet, right. They're measured under the BASIC system to not leak air. What are you working on at the moment? Anything ex exciting? Well, the, the project in, in Lightning Ridge is going ahead. Oh, great. We, we're well on the way with documentation on that. Fantastic. Um, it's uh, entirely off the grid and mm. it's a, a fairly large building. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be in the order of probably th over $30 million. And uh, we've got funding for a, a very good, a decent portion of it. We're looking for funding now for the next next part of it so we can do it all in one go. Because, you know, doing a project in one go is more economic than having bites at it. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you, we, we both know that. You know that from the mosque. I mean, that, that, that's a labour of, of over a decade's love. That's a hard, hard road to hoe, that one. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's Maybe. exciting, because that's been on the around for a while too, hasn't it? Two thousand and three. Yeah. And uh, so, but we've been developing it, and we've got very good consultants that are working on it. Yeah, so, good. Uh, that's that's all good. Also, got a, a Shaolin monks from China uh, project for oh wow fifty monks down south of Nara. Um, oh, fantastic! Includes a Zen meditation space and kitchens and dining and accommodation and prayer prayer areas and all sorts of things, which is a fabulous project. Is that, is that a, like a temple or a, is it a, yeah. a monastery? Yeah, it's rather like it in, in, in the Christian world, like a monastery, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, fantastic. It, it, they, they took me to China um, to see their, their headquarters yeah. in uh, Dongfang, which was a fantastic place. They dressed me as a monk. And oh. 
I lived as a monk for, for 10 days, which was extraordinary. For someone from a flat city like Melbourne, it's Sydney's topography that's fantastic. And, and that causes a different streetscape and it's a much older city than Melbourne. So finding those little bolt holes where there's half a dozen um, chairs in a, sitting at the front of a, a, a stainless steel bar in Sydney, you know, usually with a with a Moreton Bay fig tree in the in the street or a or a peppercorn tree, they're, they're fantastic. I I I think you're being too hard on Sydney. I think it's a great city. Um, well, the topography is wonderful. There's no question about that. And Sydney Harbour is extraordinary. Superb. Place. It's the lungs superb. of the city. It's where the great summer nor'east breezes come through their heads there and drive up through Sydney Harbour and take all the muck out. Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't be making all that muck, but it does do it. And it's the most beautiful thing that North East Priest in summertime. I also think, I, was, I mentioned this in my talk the other night at UTS, that that area around Chippendale and where, where UTS is, there's been, and there's some, some very well-renowned architects who've worked there, both Australian and, and international. And, and the, the general quality of the development of that part of Sydney is really good. And same with Barangaroo. The, the, I, I look at Melbourne now on our peripheries and I see an awful lot of really quick building that's expedient. Yes. Um, and, and it's changed the feel of Melbourne from a, a really beautiful gridiron city you know, along the lines of New York or Chicago into something else and and i'm not convinced by it as a city anymore because sydney can't do do that to itself sydney maintains its its rigor purely because of its its almost lack of order in its streetscape in the 60s when when sydney and melbourne were growing i mean harry seidler in, in sydney was a profound influence in terms of the cityscape the sky, the skyscrapers that, that he did i'm thinking of australia square yes but um, there was also just the beginnings of murmurings about modernism needing needing to be reassessed, and that was probably happening in America more than anywhere. So you know, the the subsequent ten years saw change, and some of the change was needed because the international style work that was starting to appear wasn't very good, and it needed to be shaken up. But I mean the. You know, the Harry Sidler Tower, there are a couple of Harry Sidler buildings in Melbourne. One's at Glen Wa or I think it's Glen Waverley or Mount Waverley Town Hall. Yes, I know the other that. is the, she the old Shell House. Yes. They're beautifully built buildings too. Yeah. They're really beautifully put together buildings. And they will still be good in 50 years' time. I hope so. I hope they're left, left alone or looked after. Yeah. And it's not just an Australian thing. There is a... There's, there's a phenomenon around the world where architects believe that every building has to outdo the previous one and they make decisions that are profoundly about attention seeking. So they're screaming architecture with no necessarily um, logical rationale behind the decision making other than that. Yeah. But there's also conversely the work that is, you know, Speak, speaking quietly about um, what what the architectural proposition of the building might be. And I think we're going to see, to go back to what we were speaking about before, we're going to see now um, a, a, a really rigorous architecture coming out of climate that where a lot of stuff is in, in, invested into a building to, to get it to perform better. And that could be a really interesting time because we might see buildings starting to change themselves completely um, to, to address the, the warming of the planet. So those buildings that scream architecture with a capital A at you, I don't think they've got much more time in, in, in the discourse. Or if they do, they're probably not going to be taken quite as seriously as they, they might have once upon a time. Yeah, but one of the problems Sean, in all this is, I, I've always felt that the, uh, the architecture that's built of the day is a measure of the culture. And, uh, and, you know, it's not just architects, 
it's the client base selecting the sort of work. So until the culture of the public can change to a, a more sophisticated and understanding uh, of the process of that junction between the rationale and the poetics that can occur in architecture, and until we've got those sort of clients, we're going to get the sort of stuff that's coming now. And that's the measure of our culture at the moment. And that's why it's happening. I mean, projects like Naomi's M Pavilion project and, and and not not just that, but also projects by other patrons of architecture are most important because they bring architecture into the lexicon. So people get the benefit of going to the M Pavilion and, and engaging with architecture at times without even realising it, but simply because they're there for an event. Yes. And, and that that's quite a powerful thing to do, particularly in a country that doesn't have architecture as, as an investment or the community doesn't see architecture as an investment in our culture. Mm. Like you might encounter in, in Italy, for example, where after 2000 years, they understand that it's actually a really important thing. We should have kept Utsun around so he could finish his building in, in Sydney rather than drive him out of the country and not let him ever see the finished product. Yeah. So we're still kind of making those errors. We, what we don't understand in Australia architecturally, we, we, we deride um, and, and that's a pity yeah. because we're better than that. What you recognise, of course, is that um, Naomi as a client is one of those rare clients yeah. who has given architects the opportunity of doing something that is that is very potentially very special. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be a fandango. It can be something that's calm, that's that's that has a serenity about it, that is logical, but it also can be beautiful and it can be operable. It can change and develop and do things. And uh, Naomi has given that opportunity and she has selected a group of people that are in a sense, experimenting with some of those things. America has a great culture of patronage in the arts and architecture that, you know, is, is deeply invested in, in serving the community as well. I mean, the great patrons of, of architecture in America um, usually, usually exist in public buildings where we look to our governments to pr provide them. In America, they're of, often privately funded. That's gifted to the public. Yeah. yeah. So we, we've still got a ways to go. And whether we ever get to that point, I'm not sure. But but they also have their share of rubbish. Oh, sure. Well, we, everyone does. <laughs> and when it's, when it's bad, it's really bad as well. In, it's interesting that these things are running in parallel. So in the midst of, a, of the pandemic, there was the tragedy in America. And that, and that galvanised people in a different way. And, and until then, people had been galvanised about the virus. And suddenly, there's another issue there. And so I hope it, hope it turns out for the best. I think it probably will. You know, as Australians, we've had a bit of a battering, haven't we, since last uh, November, really, December, uh, with the fires. Then came the floods that put the fires out. It also made floods. Um, yeah. And then the pandemic. Now, it's been it's been a real it's been a real hit for many of us. I mean, remember, recall the smoke that came into the cities, equivalent to each person smoking forty cigarettes a day. There were days like yeah. that. Yeah, and there was, it was, shocking. A it, was, it was day after day as well. It wasn't just a day. No, day after day. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And we've taken a battering on this. And I think that when we can get through all of this, we can have a bit of quietness, settle down and work out what are our real priorities. Yeah. No, it's true. The, um, w there's, a, there's a desire for something soothing and calming yeah. and, and, and not, not, a, 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 not the violence of nature and, and, and the violence of humanity. And, and I think a lot of people are, are hankering for just that calmness that comes, or the serenity that comes with 
all of that, that, you know, the opposite of what we've, we've been through. As Barrigan once said, any work of architecture that is designed without serenity in mind is in my view, a mistake. And when serenity possesses joy, it is ultimate. And I think that goes for our cities, goes for our squares, our parks. You can have exciting things, but the idea of serenity is so important. Well, it's, it goes back to what we were talking about before about architecture yelling too loudly that not every, every square metre of a piece of architecture needs to be architecture. That's right. Some of it can be just just absolutely non-architecture so that when you arrive at that moment in the building that's interesting, it's, it's emphasised and exaggerated. Not every single bit has to be yelling architecture. And it's the same in nature. You know, when you go for a walk through the bush and then you, you come to a, a, a stream or a waterfall, it's the contrast between the serenity of the bush and the drama of the moment.